Okay. Uh, the title of my talk is very general, and I won't say even what I'm going to talk. It will come about as we are going along. Okay. No, I don't understand. You don't hear me? No. You have to talk. No, but he put the separate microphone. just for the camera. No, there was another one yet. Okay, okay. Now you hear me. Okay. Fine. So, uh, everything that I'm talking about is about connections. And in a sense, connections are so important now that we can rephrase the old saying, uh, cogito ergo sum is the comunicado ergo sum. <laughs> because if I don't communicate, I don't exist. So this is an, uh, some kind of network. Let's not worry about it. So uh, this is like a graph, a network. It has n vertices, n links. The big question is, what are the vertices? What are the links? The vertices could be people related in various ways, cities connected by various uh, roads, neurons, charges, just points. They could be. What are the links, the roads, the synapses, propagators in Feynman diagrams, fluxes between charges, or just connections in an abstract way? So how is this talk connected with Yakir? So the honest answer is that it's not connected. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, 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 the speaker, what about the speaker? Yes, he is connected. Uh, he was talking, uh, Yakir with Aaron Kasher, and they would keep asking, just like with Serge, what's new? and in particular in dark matter, because they knew I was interested in this. So I'll start with this and tell you dark matter exists, at least I believe. It's proven by rotation curves. There's something called the bullet clusters. And this may be the silver bullet killing uh, something called MOND, you know, modified Newtonian dynamics. And by the way, uh, so let me go back. Oh, where am I going? Go back. Go back. So this shows some subset of connections. You see, Yakir Aronov is in the center. If there would be a directed connection, then most of these arrows would point from the center outward. And I just, unfortunately, there is one person who is missing here. He's missing totally. That's Aaron Kasher. And I have spent in the company of Aaron Kasher and Yakir Aronov may be 5% of my waking hours. I would be there, they would argue and argue every time Kasher says something. Uh, Aaron Kasher would say no, no, and then eventually he would, might be convinced and then they would do something about it. And I was just waiting and waiting. There was the AA effect, Aronov Anandan, AB effect, AC effect, I was waiting for the A-N effect. Maybe, maybe you have to wait a long thing in the alphabet. And then there was an ANPR paper. I will not tell you about this. It's kind of an interesting paper. Unfortunately, I, together with some, my son and others, found that it is wrong. <laughs> the only paper that I really suggested in our common <laughs> works. Anyway, so uh, what can I tell you about dark matter? I won't tell you much. I want to say that uh, the cosmic microwave background and what's called Big Bang nucleosynthesis imply very strict conditions on light degrees of freedom. So neutrinos, the sum of the masses of all neutrinos should be less, according to some recent analysis, than 0.12 eV. They could never be dark matter. But there is still a question. Can this background of cosmological relic neutrino, can it be detected? And the answer, unfortunately, due not just to me, but in particular to me and my son, Zohar Nusinov, is no. And the no is purely because of quantum mechanics, because of the Heisenberg uncertainty relation. Now, what dark matter? is we know that it cannot be many things because we looked for this and that kind of dark matter. It cannot be many, many things, but what is it? Well, 
<laughs> we don't really know. The masses of possible dark matter candidates ex uh, runs over something like 80 or 90 orders of magnitude between very heavy black holes to something called fuzzy dark matter, something whose mass, whose uh, de Broglie wavelength is the size of galaxies. Uh, so we really don't know that much about dark matter. But the middle three cascades, the 10 to GeV to 10 TeV, they were called the WIMPs, the weakly interacting massive particle, and weakly meaning weak interactions, not just weakly, weakly. And weak interactions are pretty strong, and the direct detectability of these things is unbelievable. If the cross-section of dark matter on a nucleon would be even as small as 10 to the minus 48 centimeters squared, it's unbelievably weak it would have been detected by careful existing experiments. And also it might have been detected by annihilation. And there's something called the WIMP miracle that such WIMPs would just annihilate just the right way to leave the right amount of required dark matter. And there is the LHC SUSY connection that they can be easily discovered in LHC as the lightest supersymmetric partner. No evidence yet for this. And this led to a paradigm shift, so to speak, that the dark matter now, if it's of particle form, has a mass of GeV or less. And to explain the structure, structure meaning structures of galaxies, of subgalaxies, of clusters, and so on, the dark matter is likely to be a synth, meaning self-interacting massive particle. And in particular, the mutual cross-section of, of, sorry, <laughs> I thought it was a pointer for a moment. The dark, dark cross-section divided by the mass of the dark, uh, partic uh, dark matter particles in these funny units of centimeters squared over a gram, or barn, barn is uh, Fermi squared, it's 10 to the minus 24 centimeters squared, it's a thousand millibar, whatever, it divided by GeV in this unit, it should be order one. And this happens to be, for some crazy reason, also the threshold cross section of slow neutrons on slow neutrons. And this kind of dark matter has been unknowingly suggested by Lee and Young 70 years ago. They felt so bad about violating parity that they suggested that the one can restore in some way left-right reflection symmetry by postulating that there will be a mirror particle for every existing particle. And in the mirror sector, the left-handed weak interaction will be mapped into the right uh, interaction. And if, the, if it happens that the dark matter is a mirror neutron, not a mirror proton, this is a little bit subtle, then the, even that will have the right sigma dd. And the total baryonic mass is simply duplicated here. They didn't realize it's dark matter. Okun and Kobrazev said, oh my god, this is extra matter. This is problem. No, it was not a problem. Now we know that the dark matter is five times as much as the baryonic matter. And uh, so it's not a perfect model. It also has six extra light neutrinos. And we saw that we have at most, uh, the number of light neutrinos must be very large, a small, maybe a quarter, an extra. And also, uh, OK, we need for that to flip. We have this really unnatural thing that the mass of the weak, more weakly charged dark a quark is heavier than the mass, a down quark is heavier than the mass of the up quark. And that's why the mass of the neutron is heavier than the mass of the proton, which is a key for life. I mean, if there is any argument for the anthropic principle, the strongest one that I can think of is here. Well, there are some other arguments. So uh, let's assume that indeed it's flipped and it will be a neutron. Uh, because to have the dark matter being a charged particle, it's a little bit a problem. Uh, but this scheme is, has a, a little problem. So we ha I have a scheme, which I will not discuss here at any length, where we can use the existence of three fermion families to 
uh, explain to have uh, five types of extra self-interacting dark matter neutrons. So the five will be exact here. The five is three factorial minus one. And it explains why we have not detected dark matter. A wonderful scheme, except there is a fatal problem in this model, which I will not discuss. Should I give up or discre use a discretized overlapping six replicas of three-dimensional space? An idea independently suggested by Akir for other reasons. Uh, and there is a con connection with the, of this with the nets. The nets is the motif, the main motif of this talk. So now I'm changing gears altogether. We go to London, June 1815, to tell you the importance of quick rely. Before you change gears, can I ask a quick question? Uh, your, um, your mirror neutrons will decay, will they? If we the, the, the mirror neutrons will not decay because they are the lightest. The mirror protons will decay to, to mirror neutrons. Better decay very fast. Oh, it's the other way. Sure, sure. Uh, we, we are making it to be this way. Okay, so we go to London, 1815. This is the picture of Nathan Meyer Rothschild. He learns first about the victory in wa Waterloo by apostle pigeons. He has a half hour or so ahead of anyone else that he knows these things. And he used this to manipulate the stock market to become <laughs> extremely rich. This may be an anti-Semitic slayer propagated by some French uh, person who hated him for being a Jew and also for helping uh, Wellington and these people who beat Napoleon. So. <sighs> I don't know. This, the, 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 the argument is that there was another Jewish person whose name is Ricardo, Alberto Ricardo, who did it and he was. But never mind. It's a nice story. Now, let's see another situation where we may take advantage by extra little time. Let P and P prime be antipodal points on Earth. So this is points which are on Earth. Uh, two sides of a diameter, say in Buenos Aires and Shanghai. Unfortunately, this is tipped the other way, but let's. And now suppose we could communicate directly between them, not going with a radio wave around the earth, but communicate directly. We would gain exactly 27 milliseconds. It will be faster than radio. Communicate by what? Ah, good question. Here is the question. Communicate by what? By the well, tree? You, you, you put a number. What is this number? Oh, the numbers communicate with anything that moves with the speed of light. In fact, it turns out later we'll see that the reason LHC works and CERN accelerators worked so well because they were communicating actually uh, along diametric opposite point. If there would be a tunnel, no, no. If we could communicate with objects that move with the speed of light, then we will gain that much extra time, 27 milliseconds. Yeah, it's easy, pi minus 2 times the radius of the Earth divided by C. Believe me, it's 27 milliseconds. It may be good enough to manipulate the stock exchange, except nowadays it's, they took some measures against it. So can we do this thing with neutrinos? Maybe. And people suggested maybe the extraterrestrials send us signals with neutrinos and we don't detect them because we are not so advanced. No way in hell. There is an argument that I can tell you very intrinsically because the pi on the case to mu and the new mu and the new mu has an uncontrolled transverse momentum, which may be tiny compared, will be 30 MeV compared to three tera electron volt of, of the, of the uh, neutrino, the longitudinal, still at a distance of a kiloparsec, the spot size will be 2,000, sorry, 20,000 AUs. And there is not enough ice in any planet to make so many ice cube detectors to detect this thing. So anyway, and it turns out that a 20 microsecond faster beam correction via diametric signaling 
enabled the discovery of the W and Z at LHC and earned Van der Meer and Carlo Rubia the Nobel Prize. So this idea of going along. So now. The question is, can we communicate directly to Earth at the speed of light? Through Earth. What? Through Earth. Through Earth, yes. And the answer will be, maybe the answer will come later. But while we are at this subject and talking about LHC, let me just elaborate ever so little on LHC. I consider the LHC, the Large Hadron Collider, to be a top achievement of humanity on the scale of the Chinese wall, the pyramids, and maybe even more. So it will collect during its lifetime 10 to the 17 PP collisions at an incredibly high energy center mass energy of 14 TeV. It's like about the top of the spectrum of the cosmic rays. 10 to the 19 particles will be produced. It uses, because of the uh, uh, synchrotron uh, losses, energy losses, 20 terawatt hours, which is the third of the consumption of the city of Geneva. And it forces closing it in cold winter time. And this is despite the fact that the perimeter is 28 kilometers trying to minimize this thing. There are four beam intersections. Never, I, I don't want to go into detail. The beams are bunched. There are 50 collisions per beam crossing. So in each beam crossing, we generate 5,000 new particles in a nanosecond. Altogether, the number of bits of information will exceed 10 to the 23 bits. So even the best computers cannot store and handle this. They are using triggers. So they just look at interesting events. The total cost until it will be also upgraded and operated for the next 20 years and building it and so on will be about 100 billion euros. So this is kind of a serious thing. It built to discover SUSY. It was really built to discover SUSY. Also, other things might be discovered all the way, but SUSY and the lightest supersymmetric particle, which is an ideal candidate for dark matter, and it failed. It found the Higgs, which is hailed as a big experimental triumph. Theoretically, it's a disaster, because the fact that they found the Higgs that they expected to found means that we are almost at the end of the way. But Turns out, it's not the first time. All particles, most particles, let's put it, discovered since the 1930 were anticipated. Even the neutron was anticipated, I heard, by Nathan Rosen. Oh, really? Yes. Really? This, this was written in the, in the book about him in, to which you contributed. Really? Yes. <laughs> OK. But not, not this specific thing. Anyway, uh, so when you think of uh, EPR, ER, people say, ah, he was an assistant to Einstein. He was something in his own right as well. So there is a person whom personally I don't like so much, but he really made an important point. This is Marcus Luthi. Uh, he pointed out that focusing on mainstream physics, we can miss new unexpected particles which are produced at the LHC. For example, he suggested a new set of particles that he calls quirks, which are quarks of a special kind, and strings attached to. This was a why not model, saying here is a model. I don't see anything wrong with it. And it will not be discovered, because it has these bizarre properties that we'll go on to very soon that will prevent discovering it using, you know, when we aim to discover just the round of the meal, the standard thing, uh, meaning SUSY, left, right, other standard particle model. Now I want to ask another question. Is there a possibility that new particles produced at the LHC and future other hadron colliders, say proton-proton colliders, have technological use? 
Is this conceivable even? Obviously, no. All particles except for the stable electron and the low link neutron have no technological use. Actually, the new particles that are discovered there, including the Higgs and others, have lifetimes which are shorter than 10 to the minus 20 seconds. Even the muon who lives for 2.2 microsecond, its lifetime was insufficient to allow for muon catalyzed fusion. If it would have lived 100 times longer, muons could be used to catalyze fusion, and we will have called fusion if you wish to call it for free. And Is uh, Isidore Isaac Rabi, the one from the Rabi oscillations, uh, he said, who ordered it, you know? Who, who needs this particle? And the other point, the, because they are so heavy typically, only at most one is producing 10 to the nine collisions. And still, I'm claiming that the same quirks with the string attached can give us technological use. They can solve the problem of communicating through the earth. They can solve the problem of communicating across galactic scales. And what are the quirks? Now, after all of this thing, I have to tell you what are the quirks. The quirks, which are denoted by Q primes, they carry the standard SU3 color. Uh, it's the fundamental representation. They come, each quark comes in three colors. Uh, you know, I didn't put the white color here because it would be useless, but here are the three colors that they come with. But they carry another color. They have no electroweak, they don't have charges, they don't have weak interactions, but they do have another color. And the other color is in the same fundamental representation, but it's a different color. It's an SU3 cross SU3 prime. And the specific new thing is that the scale of the new color interaction, which I denote by lambda prime as opposed to the lambda of QCD, which is 200 MeV, is much, much lighter than an MeV even, or therefore much, much lighter than the mass of the Q prime that we take to be larger than a TeV. Why would it take the mass of the Q prime to be larger than a TeV? Because it has not yet been discovered. And LHC supposedly can go there and discover it. Having such a big discrepancy between the mass of the quarks and the, mass of the, and the scale of the underlying confining theory is natural. It's not like, oh, you have to tune things. It turns out to be natural. Even in our own QCD, the masses of quarks range between 2 or 3 MeV for the up quark and 200 GeV for the top quark. One is much smaller than the scale, one is much larger than the scale, so there is nothing unnatural. So the a Q prime, bar Q prime pairs are produced in hydron colliders, but at the LHC it will be once in 10 to the 15 collisions. But the Q prime is stable, at least that much. Why is it stable? Because it's the lightest object that carries two conserved quantum numbers, the color and the new color, and it cannot decay. So let's ma uh, make the Q and Q prime uh, have a velocity of 0.1 C, which will happen about in 12% of the cases. They, they will separate because as, as they go uh, out, uh, maybe I'll start showing the next slide, which is very bad, but still. So you see, you produce them initially, the Q prime and Q prime bar, very quickly after a separating by a Fermi or so, they will generate out of the vacuum light quarks, which will shield the usual color, screen the usual color, and will have two mesons. But the other color is unscreened yet, and it will keep exerting between them a constant force, which will make them yo-yo, back and forth, back and forth. And this yo-yoing motion is what would make them undetectable or very difficult to detect at the LHC. And when will they turn around? When their kinetic energy divided by the string tension, sigma, I call it here, 
later I call it something else, uh, is equal to the length. So they just go that far and then they come back. So let me go back. They can go 10 meters or 10 microns, depending if lambda prime is 10 EV or 10 keV. The 10 microns is interesting for maybe looking for them, but the 10 meters and above is what I'm interested in. In the center mass Lorentz frame, they will go for that much distance. Let me skip this. In each passage, as they go back and forth, G prime gluons are emitted and they lose a fraction something like g prime to the sixth power times v over c, which could be 10 to the minus 4. Also, pions are produced. So after maybe 10 to the 3, 10 to the 4 yo-yos, the q prime and bar q prime in vacuum will annihilate. But uh, what happens is that for small enough, say, 10 eV lambda prime, then, then the distance is large. The Q prime and each one with a new entourage. And, uh, okay, the, the Q prime has, an, uh, say, a, a U bar quark and the bar Q prime has a D quark or whatever. They will get into the far chambers of the, the muon chambers of the detector there and outside to the rock, to the lake. They would lose energy and they would lodge in microcrystalline grains. So, if we have the appropriate uh, structure there with a, a hard material which makes mic good microcrystals, then they would lodge in such microcrystals and they will not be uh, pulled out. So, what happens is they go back and forth, then they go into some region where there is even. Coulombic energy loss and so on, eventually they slow down, and then you have the following stages. First, you make the mesons, the Q prime with the bar U and the, is a, uh, will be a meson prime and a, its antiparticle likewise, and then it will uh, attach to a nucleus, a nucleus AZ. It turns out that analog things like the K0 doesn't bind, actually K plus doesn't bind to nuclei. K minus does and makes all these hypernuclei. But because of the heaviness and so on, it will always bind to nuclei. And the nucleus is sitting inside the ion. And the ion may be inside the crystalline grain. And the binding force, which is the potential divided by it, typical distances, say 2 angstrom, 50 eV, is essentially, if we, the force in units of eV is 220 eV squared. It's much bigger than the tension, the string tension prime. T here is not temperature, it's tension, which is proportional to lambda prime, uh, so long as lambda prime is smaller than 200 eV, and we take it to be 20, so it's certainly fine. So the force will not pull the Q prime and its entourage, and it will stay in the grain. So here is the three stages. First, you, you just uh, uh, have a quark produced, and, but still there is the, the color dangling out, the new color. And then this thing will attach to the to the uh, nucleus will be sitting inside the nucleus, which is sitting inside an ion. And the whole thing is sitting now inside the microcrystal, inside the grain. And it's connected with this to another one, the anti one, which is sitting in a different grain, hopefully. And now we have the following thing. This now solves the problem of communicating through the earth and communicating at arbitrary large distances. We have the Q prime sitting in one microcrystal, the, the Q sitting, the Q prime bar sitting in the other. And between them, we have this string. We send transverse phonons along these strings with some desired uh, lambda. It's fixed by the frequency of pulling this up and down. And these guys move along this string with the speed of light. And the reason is because 
Okay, before that. So what happens is we have now the situation with Alice and Bob who want to keep communicating. Alice hops into a rocket and travels, well, I'm exaggerating here, well, 10,000 light years, never mind, 10 to the 20 centimeter. It stays all along in touch with bobs, not what one bob, because Bob died long ago. You're talking his son, his grandson, his Bob uh, uh, Junior, Junior Prime, 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 uh, by sending and receiving transverse phonon along the strings, just as we have shown here. And so this is a, an artistic picture. Here you see she's going in the rocket. She's sitting inside here. She's actually levitating in the rocket. The rocket moves close to the speed of light. So the Bob, that Bob died, and now there's Bob Jr. and Bob Jr. Jr. By the, she comes back and meets them. But all along she can communicate with them and tell them what she sees because she has this end of the string. And the string can go through the earth. It can go through anything. It's only the ends that, f that feel it's uh, 30 minutes. No? OK. I think we have a chance to finish. The wave velocity, which is the, the usual expression, t over rho, because of the structure of this uh, essentially relativistic string, is c. This is just like a string, a string of string theory almost. And the dispersive corrections are tiny. They are d over lambda squared d is the thickness of the string, which is essentially 1 over uh, lambda prime. And when we do this thing, it turns out that for even kilohertz band, uh, you know, wavelength of 10 to the 4 centimeter, the effect is negligible. And the other thing, though, unfortunate thing, is that the we will make glue balls out of the G prime and G prime. And they can be dark matter candidate, and they are bad dark matter candidates. They can, the mass of the, uh, of the scalar, which is the lightest bound state, will be uh, seven times lambda prime. This is a solid number from lattice calculation in QCD. Seven is really a solid number. It's somehow because it's a piece of string that goes around and closes on itself. You can think that there is a two pi there or something, but never mind, it's a seven. And it will, can be easily anything from 70 EV to 70 KV, and it already could be too much, particularly if it's 70 KV. So we have to push lambda prime to be light, which we wanted anyway to do in order for the thing to really go into the rocks and so on, and be staying in the grain. And the S is stable also. The point is that in order for it to decay, it has to first dissociate it into its 2G prime. They have to couple to a box of quirks because that's the only thing the G prime couples to. The quirks have to couple to the ordinary gluons. The ordinary gluons have to couple to quarks, and these carry charge, and these will go to two photons. When you're done calculating this thing or even estimating, you get a lifetime of 10 to the 50 Hubble time. So these strings are forever. Uh, so, uh, sorry, not just the strings. The strings are forever. Oh, I forgot to tell you this. The strings are forever. The S's are forever. This is a problem. But uh, the strings are also forever. And the reason is, yes. What happens when two strings cross? Oh, wonderful question. We'll come to it in three slides. This is actually one of the nicest and most serious questions on this subject. Thank you very much. But so to over, use overclosure, you need to use lower lambda prime. But the cross section of S on S, dark matter on dark matter, which can be qualitatively seen here to be of the order of one over the mass of the string squared, is 10 to the minus 14 centimeters squared. It violates the desired cross section that we discussed before of essentially a Fermi, a, a barn, which is 10 to the minus 24 per a GeV. And here we are talking about maybe 10 EV or so by 25 orders of magnitude. It's a terribly strongly interacting dark matter. It's not a good dark matter. And 
it is a noisy background to our Q prime string messaging because we have this long string and all the time it's being bombarded by this dark matter, by, by these uh, S particles in the background. It's like the, the background photons may be uh, affecting radio communication. But now we have this, the, the, the S particles, the global, and now we could also envision the global attaching to the string and really giving it its, all of its rest mass. But this is impeded by a topological barrier. In fact, thanks to Sunny, uh, Nissan Itzhaki, Tel Aviv, you actually know him. Uh, he convinced me, and I'm very convinced and happy that this effect is suppressed. Enough. So the net effect is because of this string is being this string. Let, let's go to see this. Oh, no, no, the other way. Sorry, sorry. Uh, this string is being bombarded all the time by the background of, of S quarks. Essentially, they will get equal temperature. The string has a rich spectrum, and it will have a temperature which equals the temperature of the background. And the effect of such heating of the string will be absolutely minimal on the wavelengths of interest. So, uh, oh, is that, is that? oh my God, where did we go? We need to go, okay. So now comes another question, and the, this question, and an, another difficulty with the communication, which has to do exactly with this question. Another hurdle pointed to me by Warren Siegel, who is a great stringer, but I should have thought about it myself, and I was very mad not thinking about it myself. What happens if cosmic rays produce, you know, because a cosmic ray can hit a, a proton and even have a center mass energy like like at LHC and produce the Q, Q prime, Q prime bar pair and produce a string that goes back and forth and then it comes and it will cut our string. There's no question, it will cut our string. So I call it rogue strings from cosmic ray uh, interstellar medium interaction. And the cross section of string on string is huge. It's the length of these strings which is thousands of light years and the next length of these strings that could be 10 meters or so. so however, if you, if you take into account that the cosmic ray flux, its equivalent LHC energies is so small that the number of uh, uh, interstellar uh, protons per medium is just one per centimeter third so the, the mean free path is 10 to the 25 centimeter versus the distance it travels in vacuum until it annihilates, which is only 10. We get another factor of 10 to the 15. And also they are produced only in one in 10 to the 15 collision. So we gain a factor of 10 to the 45, which is enough. And we are okay with this. And the absolute claim that I will not prove here is that even if 100 Q prime grains are produced in the vicinity of LHC, in the mountain next to LHC. We can, in principle, isolate them and make the Q prime communication feasible. So the main conclusion is, unlike what this German lady, Sabina, says, keep LHC going and other operators. Why not? Maybe we'll discover something. Now, now I want to, ch yes. What? by a, a, string, a new kind of string yeah. that is totally immune to matter. No, no, fine, but, but correct, connected by a string. Yes. But that string, you said, had tension in it. Yes. And as a result, as you pull Oh, no, 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 no. When you go in a rocket, you overcome this very easily. The, the tension is tiny, tiny. We were hoping it would explain the pioneer anomaly, some tension like this, it's too weak. It's now, believe me, that's, you, you can control it. You don't worry. You just hold it there, and it's okay. It, to hold a string of QCD 
it's 14 ton, you cannot hold it in your hand. This string is like uh, 10 to the 20 times weaker, 10 to the, it's, it's nothing, there is no, don't worry, the string will not pull, it won't pull back the rocket, because Alice is in the rocket and she's holding it and she is in the rocket. Okay, I, I hope you understand. If it's in vacuum, it will go back and forth and annihilate. That's lucky for us. This means the rogue strings, the short ones that we just produced, will not last forever. Okay, now let's change gears all together and come to the last part, not last, the one before the last part of the talk, and talk about <coughs> extraterrestrials. I'm crazy about extraterrestrials, but that's besides the point. So the question is, how would extra, first of all, extraterrestrial, I take it for granted, if they exist, they are more advanced than us. So they would have discovered us before, they would have communicated with us before, and that's why the SETI project should have never been stopped and should have been augmented and gone indefinitely. But the main point I want to make is that the extraterrestrial, as advanced as they are, will not refrain from using methods that we discovered to discover planets. And the simplest by far method, which is not working always, actually working only in very few cases, is the transit method. I'm sure you heard about the Kepler mission that found all these things. So here you have a star, a planet is crossing it. As, as it starts crossing it, the brightness of the star decreases a little. So if we do it for the extraterrestrial watching us uh, uh, slightly eclipsing the sun, they would see uh, essentially a tenth of a promille of the change of the intensity of the light from the sun. But the duration of it, the size of it, the, 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 the structure here can tell tons of things about atmospheres. And also because if this is the case, this must be that, uh, oh sorry, it must be, suppose we are here, this is the Milky Way sideways, and this is roughly where we are here. Usually it's done here, but maybe we are here. And this is the solar system. The, the angle between the ecliptic plane and the galactic plane is almost 60 degrees. There are very few stars from which we can be seen this way compared for if our plane, ecliptic plane, would align with the galactic plane. Those guys, though, that will see us, they, they can measure also as with the other method, the so-called radial velocity method and the ambiguity of the so-called sine i, one over sine i ambiguity will not be there. It will be really uh, just head on. Okay, now I want to say that all this story actually helps us answer Fermi's important question. What was Fermi's important question? Where are they? Where are they? And we, I claim that the reason why they have not yet come to us and have not colonized us, maybe they are not actually intent on colonization, let's hope, but the one reason is that they have a hard time seeing us because only Oh, sorry, only, only the guys, only the, the extraterrestrials within this uh, strip will be able to see us. And uh, maybe there are not too many of us. If they will be able to see many, many more solar systems here, and they will be busy all the time investigating them, and we are kind of hiding. And the analog of this hiding, I want to bring a nice analog, but it, maybe it will not work too well. This is a picture from War and Peace, from the movie. Uh, and the idea is that if you have ladies here, they were waiting on the side to be invited to dance. And then there are those ladies that look straight on like the Natasha's and they challenge you. And then there's these very shy ladies who put a profile on and they are not being uh, addressed by anyone. And we are, in a sense, shy because we put our profile more or less to the galaxy. 
Okay, anyway, all this thing, all the story that I told you about the quirks and communication was actually inspired, it, it was, oh, no, 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 I'm going the wrong way. Uh, was inspired by a student of Tzvi Mazze. Tzvi Mazze, Mazze like we call him, is a, a big pioneer in extraterrestrial uh, looking for, not uh, 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 extrasolar systems. And he had a student whom he fired because he was too lazy and, and talking too much. Maybe I have to blame for it a little bit. This student argued that the advanced ETs communicate with us with a method better than radio because radio requires knowing the frequency, the direction. Maybe they have a better method using new physics that they have discovered and not us. And then I started thinking, oh my God, I have this Lutis suggestion. I've been working on it independently before. So the idea is we can improve SETI by looking at the particular direction from which they can discover us. And this idea has been suggested by others before me and after me, so I will not go into it at very large uh, extent. And this leads to, a f actually, not this, the whole discussion to the following philosophical question. Are there Gödel-type physics models? What do I mean by Gödel-type physics models? I'm, I'm using the Gödel thing in a very loose sense. It's very different from the really deep mathematical Gödel incompleteness that I never understood, by the way, which actually says that mathematics is too complicated so for it to always be able to decide uh, whether a, a set of axioms and so on is complete or not, in particular number theories, you can formulate uh, proposals that may be not provable, not unprovable. There is no excluded middle as Hilbert wanted. So what are the Gödel type physics model? These are models that cannot be proven or refuted either by theory or by experiment. So do we have such models? Are these models physical and so on? An example, suppose we take this SU3 prime theory, we add an SU3 prime, but there are no quirks. We make the quirks infinitely heavy. They, we don't produce them. So we cannot discover all these strings and all this beautiful thing. And we have no GB prime dark matter. You know, because maybe uh, in the inflation, the inflanton didn't couple to these guys, or maybe too few of them. So it cannot be refuted, this theory. It's not like we have this bad dark matter that we see and we know, no, no, it can't be. But it's meaningful nonetheless. So the question, can we ever dream of discovering them? And I thought initially, no way. And now I think, yes thanks to primordial black holes of a special type. So, uh, if, how much time do I have? Uh, I don't want to five minutes. Five minutes? Well, five minutes for talk and then five minutes for... Oh, five minutes for my talk. <coughs> okay, I'm, I'm getting there. So, <laughs> uh, so, it has been suggested lately and early and on, maybe dark matter is made of black holes. Not black holes, as, uh, astrophysical black holes, because these are made out of neutron star, and we know that the total baryonic number in the early universe was very small, much smaller than, than the, 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 the dark matter the density. So, uh, could it be that we, we, we still have black holes making dark matter? Yes, if they are primordial. But you have to have them in a very narrow mass range. If they are too light, they will uh, Hawking radiate very fast. If they are too large, then they would manifest via what called femtolensing, uh, this, the other measures and so on. Uh, also the nanograph might have seen them and so on. So, the, but let's suppose we have in principle a primordial black hole that is, most of them by now decayed, 
but they make a small fraction of, uh, of dark matter. So we have some of them, and they are now in the process of decaying. They will decay faster if you have this extra uh, eight gluon primes, because gravity couples to anything. Even though it is not produced, even it's immediate, doesn't couple to standard matter at all. Gravity couples to it. So if these primordial black holes exist, and if we can observe them, which is very, very questionable, we might see it. So it's not a totally empty question. Other examples are string theory. And here I'm going against a person that I worked with and I love very much, uh, uh, essentially uh, Shelley Glashow. He said, string theory is not a physical theory because it not be refuted. But it's still a theory, God knows. And the anthropic principle and the multiverse and eternal inflation, the stuff that Lenny Suskin is pushing, is also an example of something that cannot be really proven or really uh, uh, disproven. And here I come to a very interesting clash between Lenny Suskin and Paul Steinhardt. I myself liked very early on the anthropic principle. I'm not a, a, you know, all you know, all of you know what it is. And uh, I told Paul Steinhardt, in, uh, whom I know quite well, uh, in a letter I asked him something else, that I have converted lately to the anthropic principle. And he asked me if I cease to be Jewish. <laughs> so, you know, he hates it, this thing, and so on. And, so you will hear about this tomorrow, I hope, at least. So, and another thing is this thing I was referring to briefly at, as a comment to, to uh, Paul, uh, that uh, Yakir, Aaron, of Aaron Kasher, and myself suggested that Planckian black holes may not be able to further evaporate and they would make an invisible inert dark matter you will never be able to detect them. There will be one of them per, I don't know, 1,000 cubic kilometers, and, and their interaction is gravitational. It, it's just, okay. So this brings me almost to the end. I'm coming back to graphs. Uh, so I could stop here, but if I, how much do I have? Uh, to, to, to 50, uh, okay, uh, if, if someone has an urgent question, he can do it now, but I really want to tell you about this because this tells about mathematics versus physics in a very general way. So, so let me go through it. It's only two slides, kind of dense, but so uh, you know there are something called NP-complete problems in, in combinatorics, you know, problems which all of them are equal difficulty, and we don't know whether they are presumably need exponential number of steps to, uh, in any algorithm to solve them, but it has not been fully proved. And, and many of them arise in graphs. There is something called the Hamiltonian cycle, the, the pure traveling salesman problem in its purest uh, topological form. Is, is, the, is there a one path that goes once through every one of the nodes of the graph? Here, clearly not, but maybe in some, yes. Uh, and what is the largest clique? That is, what is the largest set of objects there, individuals, say, that each one is connected with the other? They are a clique within a big company that want to secede and make their own company or something. Everyone connected to everyone is a clique. So here uh, is a problem. Uh, so a dean, this is a mythological story that is told in the connection of the, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, Clay Institute Prize. A dean, he happens to be Japanese, has to fit a maximal number of compatible students in a dorm. And the antipathy and sympathy of students are mutual in this case. So if any one is antipathic to the other, so is the other to him. So they can be represented by an undirected graph. If they are like each other, they are connected uh, by a link. If they don't like each other, they are disconnected. So the problem he has to do to find a perfectly 
compatible thing is the largest click problem. He wants to put there, and he, he's just crazy. He, he cannot solve it. Obviously, it's a hard problem. But he was a sumo wrestler in his youth. So he has a physics idea. Let's put all the students on the ice ring and let them fight it out. Pull whoever you like, push whoever you hate, and let the compatible win. Not, you know, let the better men win. Let, so even if all students are equally strong and athletic, it fails totally. And the reason is obvious. It's sensitive to the initial placement. Those in the center are likely to stay, and those near the edge, even if they are very good, and they will be kicked out. So what is the solution? Place all students in a completely symmetric manner on the vertices of a symmetric N simplex in N minus one dimensions. Let the connected vertices attract each other, blah, blah, and then you move them, and we expect the largest clique to gradually emerge. The connection to Yakira Haronov is that I had this idea while in South Carolina and uh, asked him, obviously, and he said that he thinks the difficulty will still be there somehow in one form or another, and sure enough, he was right. The largest approximate imperfect clique will emerge, but the largest perfect clique can be skipped. So we can claim some success, but not too much. So math is stronger than physics, no question about it. So let's ask the reverse question. What can math do for physics? And math now, I mean graphs. This is the, what's math for me. And the answer that I, if I had another hour, I would tell you, is everything. Graph can provide a skeleton, just a net, a connected net, or many nets, can be a skeleton for a theory of everything. And this is my contribution on the 88th birthday of Yakir. It was not liked to say an understatement. It was hated. In fact, I'm asking people here who were there, does anyone remember my talk about this? No one remembers. If they remember, they remember something else. And Yakir kindly after that says, I wish you luck. <laughs> so, okay. okay, remember that? Yeah, he remembers that. Okay, so uh, I will finish by saying, I started on this, no, I'm exaggerating, maybe only 25 years ago, and I keep working on it. On Yakir 100th birthday, I will present something that hopefully you will like. So I'll finish here, and if there's any questions. <laughs> yes. I'd like to uh, go back to the part about the uh, aliens, the extraterrestrials. Uh, I assume we are all scientists, and uh, for me, science means something uh, which can be tested empirically. Yes. And as such, is uh, refutable. So. Well, way, I'm, I'm, I'm debating. I'm, I'm not believing in it. Yes. What way is the, the, your theory about aliens? I don't have a I don't have a theory of aliens. I, I didn't have any theory about aliens, what are they, what their form is, what their society looks like. I don't have nothing. The only thing I'm saying is that they might have discovered these things ahead of us, and they may be using it for communication. They may be even sending us the one end of a string on, on some small space-like space thing, and, and if we catch it and to put it up, it's like picking up the, the other end of the phone and talking to them. So, so we agree that this part of your talk is non-scientific or not? No, it is scientific. Because if LHC discovers such things, and if they have these properties, this is possible. Look. I mean, the fact that it cannot be done now, it's, uh, and it's not my idea. The idea of quirks is Lutis. So I only want to use it, if you wish. Okay, any other questions? If not, I want to defer to 
Gullian who is good stuff to say. So. <laughs>